Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is uh, Jeff Otter, and uh, I'll be uh, co-hosting our, our presentation today. So I want to welcome everyone to the uh, DMTF Redfish Forums 2021.2 release webinar. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Otter with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Redfish Forum, the group within the DMTF standards body that uh, owns the Redfish uh, specification. And with me is my other co-chair, uh, Mike Ranieri. Mike, say hi. Yep. Hi, I'm Mike Ranieri. I'm with Dell, and I'm the other co-chair that uh, holds the pen in the Redfish Forum. So before we get started, just note that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, that recording will be made available to the public uh, soon after the uh, webinar ends, and it will be posted uh, through the DMTF's uh, YouTube channel, which can be found uh, at the link uh, on the screen or by searching for DMTF uh, Redfish on, on YouTube. So let's dive right in. Uh, this is about uh, the uh, Redfish release bundle uh, for 2021, the 2021.2 uh, release, which is uh, obviously our second release of the year. Uh, it had just uh, became uh, public uh, a few, uh, about uh, just really a few days ago. Uh, so, uh, and it's been in process for a while, uh, but uh, there's quite a bit of material. So we're gonna dive right in. So as a, uh, as a summary of, of all the pieces uh, that were part of this release, uh, you know, first is the, an update of the specification, so a minor revision uh, uh, 1.14 uh, that adds uh, a couple new features, uh, optional features, I should say, then, as is most uh, as most functionality in, in the Redfish specification is. There was also a uh, an errata version of the previous release just to catch uh, the uh, you know various uh, various clarifications that we seem to do all the time. Uh, the, the main uh, piece uh, of the release is always uh, the uh, schema bundle. So that's, uh, that's DSP 8010 in, uh, in the uh, terminology of the DMTF. Uh, and that's shipped as a zip file that you can download. We'll get into that. Uh, there was also an update to our message registry bundle. So there was a new, uh, a new registry there and some other updates. Uh, our profile spec that, uh, that describes how to do checklists uh, for, uh, for meeting in the market on implementations of, of the Redfish spec uh, that was also given some, uh, some minor updates. Uh, the bulk of the material though is in the schema bundle. And so there are this time, there are eight new schemas and 42 uh, uh, schemas that had uh, minor revisions to them. So, and, and those minor revisions always mean uh, the additions of properties. Uh, so going through that very quickly. So we have uh, new topics and we'll get through all of those individually. Uh, and then some of the smaller items that were, that were caused, uh, that, that caused uh, minor revisions uh, included support for uh, some other product categories, uh, some, uh, some, resulting uh, transitions from our old power and thermal model, uh, and then some, uh, some new metrics for, uh, for subsystems like, uh, excuse me, like fiber channel. Uh, we, we're not gonna go through uh, every change uh, today, but, uh, but they are all listed out in detail in the uh, release notes uh, contained within the DSP 8010 bundle. And I'll turn it over to Mike now to talk about the new features of the spec. Sure. So uh, one of the major additions to uh, the, the, the latest revision of the Redfish spec was to add OAuth 2.0 as a type of authorization method with the, with the Redfish service. For those who aren't familiar, OAuth 2.0 is a, is a standard framework that uh, breaks apart uh, some of the, the responsibilities for authorization versus um, uh, protecting certain resources. So some of the terms you'll see in OAuth 2.0 would be things like a, a, a resource server, which in this case is a Redfish service. So it has protected resources behind it. There's a separate entity that interacts with a client called an authorization server, which is uh, responsible for recognizing a client and granting access on behalf of, of those protected resources. So when a client is uh, uh, authenticates with the with the, the with the with the framework. It gets uh, an access token that it uses for the life of uh, uh, its session with the um, with the resource server. So no usernames and passwords need to be given to the Redfish server by by the client. Instead, it's it, it uses the the access token that was granted to to prove that it has authorization to uh, to interact with protected resources. So in order to support this within Redfish, there, there's two pieces that we added. 
the first was we extended some definitions within the account service and external account provider resources in order to configure uh, support for uh, for OAuth 2.0. So you'll need to specify things like the, um, the 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 authorization server address so the the registry service can go off and and uh, fetch metadata information about the the authorization server. And you might also need to specify the uh, the uh, the keys associated with um, how tokens are signed with the with the infrastructure, and so that that way the um, when it's uh, the when the service is given a token, it can uh, go go off and interact with the authorization server and verify the um, the signature of, of that token. Uh, the other portion we updated was to um, expand the authorization HTTP request header to show how that's used with uh, passing in the token information and also specifying how tokens are encoded. So um, Redfish is leveraging an existing standard for, um, for encoding tokens in HTTP headers called JSON Web Tokens. Um, and so within that token, there, there's a, set, a sets of information that describe things such as who issued the token, who is the recipient of the token, how long is the token good for, uh, the types of uh, privileges and roles that are granted to the client, such as uh, is this going to be a read-only type of user, is this user allowed to configure managers and, and other types of privilege information like that. And so, and so once... Um, you, once a client passes the, the token within the authorization request header, service just simply validates it, kind of, kind of similar to how it validates a username, a password, or validating that a session token is, 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 is correct. And if it's all valid, then it grants the client access to the uh, protected resource as it's uh, described in the uh, privileges. Next slide, please. Hey, thanks, Mike. Just let me interrupt real quick. I forgot sure. to ask the folks on the call. I wanted to get, let, do a quick poll question here. Uh, wanted to, and if Shannon, if you can run poll number one, we're looking just for the what your interest level is. Uh, in you know what your interest is in Redfish, and uh, you know, and it kind of kind of tells us you know what who we're talking to, and uh, uh, and and how much uh, how much detail y'all want to hear. So we'll let that run just for a quick second. All right, hopefully that's enough time to click a button. And if, you, if you've already fallen asleep, then I think we understand your interest. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got a good spread of folks. We've got a little over half of the half of the people on the, on the call are 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 doing implementations of uh, of a Redfish service on a product, uh, and then we've got kind of a split of uh, about 15-20 percent of each, uh, you know, folks on as as end users and DevOps or uh, or writing uh, client uh, client side software. So, we'd like like to see that. And and unfortunately, one person is is truly confused that. Uh, that this thought this would maybe was a fishing show. So uh, maybe they can learn something anyway. So, all right, Michael, I'll let you, I'll let you continue on then with, uh, sure. with the next major subsystem here. So uh, one of the other major topics that uh, we uh, brought into the forum were, was how do we model smart NICs within Redfish? What are the standard uh, practices and are there any gaps with the model today? And there, there were a few pieces in the data model that we, that we needed to add to support the smart NIC use cases. Uh, first was a lot, uh, was creating this uh, new type of resource called allow deny. So adding in its collection to a network device function. And what this does is, is allows a client to specify any types of firewalling uh, capabilities. So which IP addresses are allowed to go through this interface, which ones are blocked, port, port ranges that are illegal or, or disallowed and things like that. Uh, one other thing that was needed was to show dedicated processors that are on these smart NICs in some types of uh, configurations. And so uh, we needed to add a processor collection to network adapter to show the, the different types of offload processors that are associated with a smart NIC. This could be things like an FPGA or a GPU or maybe some other type of processor in the future. The other thing added was to show a new system type for a computer system. Uh, called a DP or data processing unit. And this is a, a dedicated um, offload computer system that is built onto a smart NIC. And you'll see this type of uh, device on a on SOC-based smart NIC. So it's, think of it as a 
plug-in card that happens to have a, a mini computer on it that also is your network interface for a host system. Uh, on top of this, uh, creating guidance for how to use these types of pieces to, uh, to have uh, some consistency for how to represent the, these different classes of smart NICs within, uh, within your registry service. Um, today, we have a, a data model in place called the Advanced Communications Device Model. And that's used to show things like uh, advanced uh, HBAs that, that have Ethernet fiber channel capabilities. And so a lot, a lot of what's done from a networking perspective is, is already uh, support in this model. One of the other patterns that we're trying to recommend folks to do is to implement each of these cards or modules that represents a smart NIC as its own chassis resource. So what you'll find in a lot of systems today is that uh, when you look at the chassis collection on a single rack mount server, there's a singular chassis instance to represent, this is the, the sheet metal with all my stuff in it. Um, what we're trying to encourage folks to do going forward is that, you know, we have relationships within the chassis resource to show containment. So you can point to larger chassis or that show where is my chassis located in my rack, or maybe I have a, a smaller module within another chassis. And there's also the contains relationship to show, you know, which physical containers reside in this physical container. And so using that, that existing pattern, we want to encourage people to use, to, to uh, model smart NICs as their own chassis resource. Then uh, depending on the class of smart NIC that, that is being uh, represented, you could either use the processor or the computer system resources to show the offloading capabilities. So if you have a, like a full-blown SOC on your smart NIC, use a computer system resource to represent that, that offload capability. If it's just dedicated processors, maybe it's a dedicated FPGA or a GPU where a client can, uh, or where a, a user can load their own bitstream on that to a, uh, to decide their, their own type of offload capabilities, then, uh, then, then use those resources to model that. And then there, there's also the existing address pool resource if you need to represent any sort of the, uh, the, the baked in switching configurations and capabilities of the smart NIC. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, at least from a modeling diagram perspective, uh, this, is a, this is a sample uh, um, relationship diagram of what you'd see with an SOC based smart NIC. So on your right side, you see we have a dedicated chassis instance for the smart NIC that we're calling card one. We have some network adapter collection to show, yes, there's a network adapter that's part of this, um, this smart NIC and it has its own network device function. Um, and it also has an allow deny collection to show that that type of um, IP address policy uh, settings. We also see that there is a relationship between SOC1 and card1 to show that, yeah, this is my uh, SOC that does all my offloading capabilities for some, for some, uh, for uh, incoming network traffic or outgoing network traffic. And, and we, des we show that, also show that with this new system type of DPU. And then we have our uh, kind of our host computer system, our, our normal, what we think of when we see a rack mount server calling it CS1. And we see that it, you know, it has some resources beneath like it does today, like its own processor collection. It would also have BIOS, memory, storage, or and anything else associated with that computer system. Um, it's also using the existing network interfaces collection to show which advanced communication devices is it consuming. And we see that uh, you know, there is one interface. It has one network device function uh, being uh, pulled in from that smart NIC. All right, next slide, please. Very similar here um, in terms of the, the main host system, how it has one interface and how it's uh, pointing over to a network device function that's being consumed. Uh, the, the difference here is on, this is a, an FPGA based smart NIC where you don't have a, a full system to do the offloading capabilities. Instead, you have uh, discrete FPGAs in this case. So, um, like with the previous example, this has its own chassis instance called card one. Uh, it has its own network adapter embedded within that. And it also has its own um, discrete processor collection. So in this case, we have two FPGAs and, and we have relationships between the, uh, the network device function and the processor instances to show who is offloading to what. All right, that's it for SmartNix. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, so one of the other uh, areas that uh, that 
has gathered a lot of interest and uh, it is something that we have been working on for quite a while uh, is the, the concept of a control. Uh, and for the purposes of, of redfish, a, a control is is uh, you know, is effectively a, a knob, something that a that a user or a uh, an algorithm uh, you know moves around in order to affect uh, you know the performance of of some subsystem. Uh, so in in our uh, in our model, what we've done is is leverage the concepts that we did for the sensor model. Uh, and applied them in this in a very similar manner, uh, allowing for uh, the individual these individual control points to be uh, to be exposed uh, without having to force users to dig in uh, significantly into complexities of of those controls uh, unless it's something that they're actually interested in. So uh, so each. Uh, each control is an individual, uh, an individual control point or an individual control. Uh, a control can have an associated sensor or one or one or more sensors that uh, that actually looks at the, uh, the you know the results of that of that control. Uh, and, and there are obviously a few different types of those. So uh, you can we can get into those in the in the uh, in our discussion. Uh, so sometimes there's lots of terminology, and unfortunately there there's there's so much uh, uh, there's so much history here in in, in a lot of our areas that we we run into uh, terminology overlap, so it's it's sometimes difficult to difficult to name things. So, uh, what what we're talking about though in in, a, in many formal circles would be known as an effector. Uh, so you'll see that terminology in some specifications, but we're we're going to keep try to keep it simple and call them all controls. Uh, so just uh, as we have uh, in the sensor model where there is a reading, and that is the, your primary focus for you, regardless of what kind of sensor it is, there's always a reading associated with it. Uh, and that allows uh, uh, folks writing client software to always look for a single property name. So whether it was a temperature sensor or a, uh, or a you know, a, 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 you know, a, a fan speed indicator, anything like that, it's, it all comes back as a reading. Uh, so we've done the same thing for control. So there's a, there's a property called a set point. Uh, and so that's the desired value uh, that, you know, that, that you or the system wants, uh, wants the, uh, the sensor readings uh, you know, to conform to if everything is going well. So uh, set point, probably the most, uh, you know, simplest example is your thermostat. So, you know, I set the room temperature to, uh, to you know, uh, I guess I have to use Celsius here. So say, you know, I set the set the thermostat to 23 degrees. Uh, and, you know, if it's 25 degrees, well, that's, uh, that's something that the control is trying now to make adjustments for. So, uh, so there's a sensor there, obviously, there's the, that's actually seeing what the current value is, and as opposed to the set point, uh, which is trying to get to, you know, to, to the desired, you know, the, the desired value. So the, the uh, as part of the control systems behind these controls, we did expose a, a, an object uh, called control loop. Uh, so for uh, implementations that are doing, uh, you know, what are known as PID or proportional integral differential uh, control loop uh, uh, models, uh, we have the ability to, to expose and allow changes to the coefficients that drive those algorithms. Uh, and I expect that over time we'll grow more, uh, more detailed information and, and uh, enhancements there to, to allow for other types of algorithms to run uh, and, and, and for that information to be expressed out to the user. So, uh, so as we had done with the, with the uh, sensor concept, uh, we've used this, this idea of, a, of an excerpt from a schema, uh, from one schema to another. And so that's how the control gets expressed uh, out in context uh elsewhere in the model so uh so in the environment metrics the memory and the processor uh schemas today with as part of this release uh there are new uh objects called you know for instance power limit watts and operating speed range megahertz uh those show up in the memory and processor uh environment metrics has uh the uh uh I'm trying to remember where the uh, where the power limit went, <laughs> uh, but th those are three examples that are it, the the first ones that are, that have rolled out with this release that implement these controls. So that allows uh, the, uh, the setting of a of a power limit uh, and uh, or the uh, the speed range of a of a processor. 
Uh, before I get into batteries, let's let's ask. Uh, since I since I kind of dove deep there, Mike obviously uh, went deep on the on the smart Nick model. Uh, and Shannon, let's run the second question there. Uh, you know, want to want to know what your familiarity is with redfish because we we throw around a lot of terminology here and. Uh, uh, want want to know if we're if we're talking to folks that uh, that already understand what we're saying, or if, or if we're make, giving them a list of uh, glossary words to go look up here afterwards. And Shannon, I didn't ask a fishing, didn't give them a fishing option on this one, so. All right. Well, that should be enough uh, enough time to 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 get that uh, single question. If you're not sure how to click the poll button, then I, I think we know what your level of familiarity with this kind of stuff is. So, all right. Well, again, a, a nice uh, even spread here through the through the work. Uh, we obviously have a couple folks here for uh, DMTF member companies, so I welcome all those folks, of course. And you know, and remember, you can always uh, you know you can always join the join the group. Uh, you know, and our weekly calls, and uh, uh, you know, uh, help us uh, help us knock down those issue counts. Uh, and I see a lot of folks are actually writing you know, Redfish enabled code, so that's really good to see. We're 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 we're, uh, we're super excited about the amount of uh, implementations that are out in the wild uh, these days, and and so looking looking for more and more folks to actually pick up the uh, you know pick up all that data that's being presented by the in, by the instrumentation and uh, and and doing you know interesting stuff with it. So. And still about a third of us uh, getting started, which is, uh, you know, which is the more the merrier here. So, all right. So continuing on the, one of the other uh, areas, uh, and this is, uh, this is one that we expect will be a, uh, get rid of that cursor there. Uh, th this will be another area that's going to grow over time as we've, uh, as we continue to broaden the data model for uh, that, that's, you know, represented by the Redfish schema. Uh, and that's the addition of, of, of battery and, and the associated battery metrics. Uh, so this is a start uh, of of battery management, uh, and this uh, the, the the where we started was uh, battery modules that are generally attached to uh, you know to a computer system, a server, uh, or a storage subsystem. Uh, yeah, as an example, as shown here, is is some is a battery that is. Uh, that is attached to a storage device or a storage controller uh, used to power, uh, you know, NVDIMs, uh, you know, so that, uh, you know, to give time for DRAM, uh, you know, to be flushed uh, to non-volatile memory in power loss. Uh, so, you know, the, but, but any of these kinds of batteries are, you know, what we would call a non-trivial battery. So uh, we're not expecting you to go render, uh, you know, those very simple batteries, like things like the coin cell battery that's used for the real time clock. So that's, that's not something we're looking to, uh, to express in a, in a resource with lots of detail. Uh, but uh, the ba kind of batteries we're talking about, you know, actually do have things like, you know, like amp hour ratings, uh, you know, very, you know, chemistry and lots of other details that, uh, you know, replacement information and so forth that, uh, that is useful for both end users and for, uh, for software trying to perform, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the various functions. Uh, so the power subsystem, uh, which is a relatively new uh, resource uh, as that was that was part of our uh, refactoring of the power and thermal subsystems. Uh, so power subsystem now has a new uh, battery collection. So we're just showing here there's one, you know, in this case, there's one battery. Uh, as, ba as batteries have, you know, quite a bit of potential uh, data associated with them, you know, the most uh, important one being, of course, the charge percentage. Uh, and but there's also uh, you know charge levels and and uh, you know, individual cell voltages that that may be of use, uh, you know, in, depending on the implementations. So that's all uh, that that's all supported within that uh, within that model. Uh, but to keep the, uh, the the relatively static data away from the metrics as we've done uh, elsewhere or you know practically everywhere else in the model. Uh, so we have a separate resource and this one's called battery metrics. So that's where the the you know the more uh, you know fast changing uh, you know statistics uh, you know show up. So those are kept separate from uh, you know from the bulk of the resource. And uh, and it's timely that the that we talked about these in this order because uh, the the battery metrics are using the sensor excerpt models. So the things like the battery voltage and charge levels, you know, those actually come back to. Uh, to actual sensors, uh, and so the readings of those are what are presented here in you know in battery metrics. Uh, and if you want to see details about you know how that is calculated and used, uh, you know things like thresholds uh, and any other you know data data really about that sensor reading, you know that can be uh, that can be found you know in the in the actual sensor resource itself. 
So staying with the, uh, the, the power related uh, theme here, uh, we, we've received feedback from, uh, from, uh, from companies that were uh, uh, aligning with the uh, Open Compute Project's uh, a category, a product category called a power shelf. Uh, and this is a, this, this is a product uh, type, which is a, a, you know, effectively a, a, a big box of power supplies that, that uh, take uh, input power for an entire rack. Uh, and then generally provide a, a DC power bus, uh, you know, worth of uh, uh, worth of output that is then fed to, uh, you know, all the equipment or a lar large chunk of equipment, uh, you know, also in that rack. Uh, so while we had uh, models for power distribution units and and had a lot of flexibility in that model, uh, what uh, what the model had did not have it at the at at the moment was uh, the ability to have a power supply, you know, as as part of a power distribution unit. So, uh, as we uh, as we went through this and that feedback, uh, it turned out that this was actually a fairly simple addition for us. So, uh, what we've done is added uh, the power supply collection. So this is the existing uh, power supply resource that uh, that is currently in the under the power subsystem on the chassis uh, portion of the model, uh, and so that is now uh, also available here. So it's the same. Uh, same model, and there's also a power supply metrics underneath this. Uh, so, if you know, regardless if you're monitoring a power supply that's part of a power shelf or one that's part of a, you know, part of a, a rack server, uh, all of that information is, you know, is, is presented exactly the same. Uh, and so, uh, that was really the only addition that was necessary to make uh, the power shelf work. Uh, we did go and give that product category its own collection. Uh, so under power equipment, there is one new link here for uh, the for any you know the grouping of any power shelves that are that are monitored by you know by this Redfish service. All right, and kind of lastly, in this uh, in this physical infrastructure uh, piece, we also have uh, a, a new uh, a, a new concept for uh, a, what's called cables, uh, and we would probably you know better call this you know a cable database. Uh, we're not expecting that uh, the, you know the vast majority of cables don't have any intelligence and any ability to to detect uh, detect any information about them other than perhaps that they are connected. Uh, but there we have had uh, uh, you, you know customers and feedback that uh, that requested the ability to track uh, the cabling in the data center. So they wanted to be able to, to have those as inventory to be able to show you know, where, where things went and, uh, and to give them assigned numbers. And so if, they, uh, uh, if there was a known issue or something that had been marked as bad, they knew how to, uh, how to, how to follow that and get it replaced and you know, track the serial numbers and so forth. Uh, so we have this cable resource that provides uh, you know, really both inventory and then also the ability to show, uh, you know, where both ends of that cable are connected. Uh, and, and yeah, I say, I did say both ends and, and we, you know, there are certainly the types of, you know, cables, they are commonly called, you know, octopus cables and things. And the, the model does, a, does a allow for a, a, a one to many or even a many to many uh, connection model that's, you know, that's all still called a, a single physical cable. Uh, so we give the ability to, to, to provide either uh, just, uh, you know, labels uh, that say, you know, this is where this uh, cable is connected from, you know, point A to point B. Uh, and also, if there is actually a, a, a full redfish model of, uh, of, of, say, the rack that's that's being shown in this, uh, in, in the application that's also containing the cabling database, uh, you can actually uh, put links, uh, you know, to show the cabling uh, paths through uh, through all the equipment. Uh, we think that that's uh, that would be really interesting and useful, especially for uh, various you know debugs and tracking information. Uh, but uh, do want to note that the model does not require uh, that all users you know traverse the model you know through the cable. There's always a uh, uh, the existing links. I, you know, I guess we could call them shortcuts. So uh, you know you can you can leap from you know from the from port to port. Uh, you do not have to go through the from the port to the cable back to the port uh, you can uh, but uh, but that is uh, that is not uh, uh, that that is not the main line of the model uh, and because and again because cabling was expected to be uh, you know effectively a database uh, you know entered either you know through machines uh, you know at uh, at deployment time or by you know by humans uh, you know hand entering information uh, we dropped that cable collection is uh, is just really something new under service route so there's one cable collection uh, that you know effectively for you know whatever is being provided by this service I'm trying to get my slide. All right, let me hand it over to Mike now to talk about keys. Sure. 
So um, one of the the other new additions that was part of 2021.2 is the uh, the concept of a key service and uh, and some sort of key storage within the the registry service. Um, so uh, we added key service as a root level type of service so you can find it from from a service root, and it's to allow a user to um, set up keys for the registry service or consumers of the registry service. It's not to be confused with uh, other key management types of ses uh, systems where maybe you have a KMIP server for uh, for containing your keys that that's controlled separately. The, the, this this case is for you need to install keys directly on the service, and I'll, I'll talk more about the use case uh, that drove this need in a, in a couple minutes. Um, so there were there's there's two additional resources that go within uh, key service. One is the key resource, which contains the the type uh, information and the the key itself. So, uh, the, so it's uh, designed to be uh, extensible so that you can support multiple types of key formats in the future. So, if there's like an SSH key versus an NVMe OF key, you can distinguish between the two and 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 see all the uh, um, um, additional information about uh, about how it's used. Then there's also a key policy resource. That uh, is uh, that allows administrators to uh, to to set up policy based uh, configurations for how keys are to be used. So maybe a key is provisioned such that it um, it can be used on any version of TLS as part of a connection. But maybe from an administrative perspective, you want to restrict the usage to TLS 1.3 or greater. And so this this allows uh, you to have a little bit of additional control to describe. Yeah, even though I have this key with these uh, th these types of hash functions that are supported or, or other types of cryptographic algorithms, maybe I, I need to um, have additional configuration to uh, to ensure that it's being used in the way that I want to, want it to be used in my infrastructure. And so the the initial use case was to support um, kind of an emerging emerging a. Uh, um, NVMe OF boot type of use case where you know you have a, a system that is on an NVMe OF uh, type of fabric and it doesn't have a local boot image. Instead, it will boot to a remote NVMe OF target. And so uh, to support this use case, we added the uh, two purpose-built uh, collections that, that, that stem from key collect uh, that stem from the key and key policy model. So that way we can really isolate the use case and make it uh, easy for a, a user to see that yes, if I go to my NVMe OF secrets collection off the key service, I know this is these are all uh, from my NVMe OF types of uh, key management. And likewise, NVMe OF key policies uh, within the key service so that as a client, I know that yes, that the, 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 the policies in this collection reflect how I want NVMe OF keys to be used. All right, next slide, please. So to talk more about the the uh, the NVMe OF boot key management, the kind of the 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 big envisionment is that um, you know because you have uh, separate services and entities that are that are uh, fetching and uh, consuming data, uh, the expectation from a Redfish perspective is that uh, in order to tell a system that um, you know you have a, a remote boot target and you need to install a key on on that system so that it can access the boot targets. Uh, the the thought is to use uh, Redfish in order to to uh, do that type of configuration. And so when you're configuring a system and trying to set up its boot targets, you would use Redfish to install the key on the um, uh, within the key service, in particular, the the NVMe OF boots, uh, NVMe OF secrets collection. So you, that that would contain the uh, the NVMe OF types of uh, keys for accessing the uh, the remote targets, and you would specify things like the the NQN or the remote subsystem and and, and other types of configurations. Um, as, as part of the um, the kind of the the end to end boot orchestration. When UEFI comes up, it will uh, it, and it sees that it's uh, configured to boot to boot to a remote target. It can go through its own Redfish service through the host interface in order to extract key information and start populating uh, ACPI entries to to show, um, you know, wh where are my boot targets? How do I get to them? What's the what's the key uh, information to access those boot targets and any sort of policy restrictions that that may need to be a uh, uh, be made aware of. Um, 
this allows that uh, for the fact that you know once once UEFI is done, it it needs to hand off to the OS to continue the boot process, and it has to reestablish in the OF uh, uh, connections to uh, to continue pulling from the boot image. So, so the the OS um, once it's uh, transitioned to the OS to continue booting, um, it will use these ACPI entries to to track. Okay, how do I um, how do I rediscover the key information and uh, reconnect to my remote boot target and and keep uh, keep with the the OS boot process. And that's it for uh, for uh, the key service. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, so uh, yeah, we've that reaches the end of our of our prepared remarks. Uh, and if uh, if you have questions, uh, you know you can open the chat window there and ask a Q and A. We will uh, attempt to answer them as best we can. Uh, I want to throw two things out. So so number one, if uh, I'll start by asking a question, and that's our third our, our third poll here uh, regarding uh, your your uh, uh, awareness of the uh, DMTF's open source tools that. Uh, that have been released uh, for Redfish. So uh, if you can take a second to answer that while you also mull over uh, any questions you have for uh, Mike or myself. Uh, the other thing that we will throw out for you is that uh, immediately following the conclusion of this uh, webinar, uh, Mike and I and some other uh, Redfish forum members will be uh, joining a, a live Zoom call. Uh, so if you want to talk to us one-on-one uh, -on -one and ask questions uh, uh, about anything except for phishing, uh, we'll uh, we'll be there to hopefully answer those and and you know give you any guidance that we can. So. Uh, and while we're waiting, I'll give you another second to think about that poll question. And in the meanwhile, let me show uh, our last uh, our last slide here. So, uh, if you uh, for those of you that are fairly new to to the Redfish uh, ecosystem, so here's the kind of the, the collection of links uh, for you to go look at. Uh, the one to really remember uh, is uh, the uh, the developer portal redfish.dmtf.org. Uh, if you go there, you can get to everything else on this page, uh, and and that will give you uh, not only a lot of the educational material material that we've developed, but also uh, pointers out to the GitHub repo and, and really, you know, anything that we have, uh, uh, you know, that, that relates to Redfish is available from the developer hub. All right, so Shane, let's take a look at the results of that poll, and then we'll see if there's any questions. Well, that's great. There's uh, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, of awareness of the uh, tools, so that's the uh, good. And I see there's still about well about 20% of the folks on the call that were did not uh, were not aware of those. So uh, now you know. Uh, so please go to the uh, to the DMTF's GitHub repo, and you'll see uh, a lot of uh, a variety of things, either uh, from uh, the Python libraries, uh, the tackle box tools for for really simple. Uh, you know, you know, easy to use, uh, uh, you know, qu quick, uh, uh, quick command line uh, 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 tools to get some jobs done. Uh, and then also a lot of the uh, conformance tools you know, used for doing you know, testing of your own, uh, your own services. So, uh, so that's great. And let's see if we've got any other questions, uh, open questions here. I'm not seeing any, which is, uh, which is fine. Uh, if you, if you all want to just join us in the, uh, uh, in the open forum uh, on the, on the Zoom call, that's a, uh, uh, clearly a lot easier than typing. So, uh, and so Shannon, you've got that, uh, there it is. Uh, so she's got the, uh, uh, you find that in your chat, there is the link to the Zoom meeting. And with that, I'll give just another one more second to see if there's any questions coming in otherwise. All right, well, not seeing anything. I appreciate everyone's attention. I think it was uh, the session, I think was was good. We had quite a bit of material this time. So uh, again, look at the, look at the materials uh, that are available. This, the, the pres this presentation is actually uh, also available. It's called the Redfish uh, Release 2021.2 Overview. Uh, that's also available for download from the DMTF site, uh, as well as a history that, that actually uh, takes the presentations all the way back uh, from the first Redfish release. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, we'll thank you again for your attendance. Uh, on behalf of Mike, myself, and uh, the DMTF Redfish Forum, uh, thank you for attending. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone.